And I got to tell teachers, principals, administrators, get your back up. Get on top of your game and back your game. And don't ever believe that you can be, that okay is just okay. Okay is not good enough. And I think in some cases we have a, no, a, a great number of, an amount of that pervade our whole community. We, we can't be about that. We got to be about saying we're not going to let people go on national TV and do programs about us that's not totally true, but a lot of it is true. But if we don't want it to be true, then we have to change the story. Our actions will change the story. Nobody in the outside is going to change that story. So th those are some of the attitudinal kind of things and cultural kind of things uh, that we have to change. I don't want anybody in this system to believe that good enough is good enough. The very best you can do is good enough. And that's what we're going to be pushing in every part of the system. And also, I want people to understand everything we do, I want it to be about educating that child. I don't want any pet projects. Because in some regards, we have, this is a great community. We have so many people that want to help the kids of Detroit public school system. And I want to be careful with this statement because I don't want to turn them off. But it's not organized. It's not coordinated. And they're stepping on each other. We don't, it becomes counterproductive. And we got to make sure we're coordinating that and getting it pulled together and we can maximize it for the well-being of the students in this community. So. You, you talked about not having a Rodney Dangerfield feel kind of mentality. What do you mean by that? Explain that. Well, it's, it's uh, I'm second class, or I'm second, or uh, I'm not a winner. Um, I don't accept that. Uh, but I don't believe anybody will give us that right. We have to earn it. And we got to back it every day. Every day that we come to work, we got to back it that we're not second class. We're not going to accept defeat. We're going to go out and we're going to make it happen. What's and we have to permeate the system with that. And our young people have got to feel it and believe it. What can you tell parents and students in the short term? Because right now there's a lot of uncertainty. Most people don't know where they're going to work or what school is going to be a regular school or charter school. There's a lot of uncertainty. So what can you say in the short term about what parents and students can expect? There's going to be a continuation of the closure and consolidation process as it is. What, what else can you say just to give people an idea of you know, the stability that you're trying to build? Two things. Uh, we'll have some announcement later this week about uh, maybe summer school. Uh, but the plans that have been laid out for school closures, we're going to continue with that program uh, until we dig deeper and we're smarter about what we're doing. Uh, we won't change those plans. Wrong thing to do. Giddy up woe does not work. we got to make sure we stick with the plan. But just generally, I think everybody knows the number of students we have today and the number we had once upon a time. And it's down by more than 50%. We've got to change. We have too many schools, and we've got to change. Now, doing that, it can't just be demographers talking to us. It can't be us just looking at a map. We've got to take parental involvement and input into consideration. Academics, the, the teachers, we're going to take all that into consideration. But we're going to right-size this system with the right number of schools to take care of our students. We have to do that. That's a lot of our cost. That's wasted cost in our system that we can't afford. we got to fix it. You know, Mr. Roberts, some people are watching you carefully because they know you have this power now. But you said something in support of the teachers. I'm assuming you're not going to be this big bad guy who walks in and says there will be no collective bargaining. But we can sit down and work things out. I think uh, I see some media people here that uh, was in the room when the governor appointed me. And as the governor and I walked toward the lecture, I stopped him. And the president of the union was standing behind the media. I walked over to him and says, I want you at the table. I'd rather have him at the table than not at the table. It's clear if I have all the tools and you have none, weapons sitting across from me, I don't have to be a bully. If you want the same thing I want, that's a quality education for the young people in the city of Detroit, I'd rather have you at the table than not at the table. I feel the same way about members of the school board. So I don't have to come in with a hatchet, but I better have a good scalpel. Anything that Robert Bob has done that you think needs review or needs to be changed or roll it back or what? Uh, we're going to review uh, all the contracts. We need to do that. We have several. If I look at my staff and the organization chart, half of the people are contract people. I have a great concern about that because those people will leave here and leave no institutional knowledge behind, and we've got to 
It's a problem short term, but longer term it provides an opportunity. An opportunity to bring some of the best people in this nation from here in Detroit or outside of Detroit into those jobs that can make us a better organization. So we're going to be really busy on that. Uh, I can't tell you that I'm smart enough to say any of the changes that are going to take place. But as I said earlier, we're going to be reviewing everything that's in place and everything's on the table. Everything's on the table. In that same vein, talk about the transition. I know Mr. Bob is here through the end of uh, June. What's the transition been like and what kind of advice has he given you? I can, I can tell you that Bob and his staff have been unbelievably cooperative. And I've had a transition team that sat across from the staff and Mr. Bob and they've downloaded all the initiatives that we have going on uh, in the district. And uh, I'm going to accept some of those and some I'm not going to accept. Uh, I, I just can't thank Robert Bob enough for what he's done. And, you know, I'd say one other thing. I think since he was the first guy to come along, he took some hits. And I don't try to justify him or, or say they were wrong, but he was the first. And uh, from where I sit and when I look at it, I see some things I don't like. But I'm absolutely convinced he did exactly what he had to do at that point in time. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do exactly what I have to do, moving toward the goal of educating young people. Are you prepared to take those hits, the ones like he took? Uh, I might take more. Mr. Robert. And if you aren't willing to do that, you shouldn't take this job. Because uh, the media has been awfully kind up front, the introduction. But I know how long that will last. That will last until you make some of the tough calls. And, uh, but this job is all based on tough calls. It's based, my success is based on making the tough calls. Somebody got to make the calls. If you don't make them, guess what will happen? We'll continue to hurt the young people in this system. I'm going to make the call. I'm going to make the call. And we'll let everything else fall where it will. We've Mr. got to make the call. Yes? One of the tough calls is going to be dealing with this $327 million budget um, deficit. I mean, it sounds like you're really focused on education and making things right here for kids, but that's sort of this you know, dark cloud over the district. What, are you going to hire a fiscal expert for that? Are you going to take that challenge on? Can you explain a little bit more about how you're going to deal with that? I can't tell you at this moment, but I can tell you we, we started to dig into the budget a bit. That is tomorrow. We're going to get deep into that budget because we got about 45 days before it's supposed to be completed. So I can talk about education and the importance of it, and that's number one, and number two is the budget. The real key is don't spend any more than you have. Cut out the things that are unnecessary. Merge some operations. Hold people accountable for performance. There are ways of getting at it. I'm not convinced as I stand here without digging deep that you can do it in one year. It didn't happen over one year. But we've got to have that in the front of our mind in everything we do. Educate the kids. It's like changing tires while you drive the car down the road, but you've got to get it done. Because nobody's going to come here and save us. And I think there's a general feeling that the state or somebody will just forgive us for all of our sins. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Yes, sir? I was just wondering, there's going to be a lot of pressure on teachers to get this job done. How important is it that parents get involved as well? It's, it's critically important. Uh, I can tell you, if when you talk to any principal, I, I think this is not o overly grossly stated, where you have parental involvement, you're going to see an increase in the performance of students. We need parents desperately. And I'm going to be reaching out to parents and reaching out to the community because we have to have it. They've got to be a part of it. They've got to be a part of their young people's success. They got to be a part of saying we we got to reward excellence. We got to make sure that we're celebrating excellence, academic excellence. When's the last time you saw some big celebration about uh, academic people? We got to do it. We got to celebrate their successes, and the young people need to see that. And what I really hope that we can do, wishful thinking, I don't want us to get out and have these community meetings where we can't be civil to each other more uncivil than they are in Washington, D.C. We're telling young people, this is the way we want you to act. That's wrong. That's not what we want them to see. Intelligent people ought to be able to discuss things, ought to have their input, and you ought to do it with a high degree of civility. I'm going to be pushing for that, and I hope that the community feel that same way, and maybe we can make a difference.
How about two more questions? How many positions are you looking to fill? I'm sorry? How many positions are you looking to fill and, and of what nature? About four positions. Uh, as we stand here today, I don't have an HR director. And I'm afraid of open, by going public with this, I open a floodgate, and I don't need that because I'm going to really try to select the best that I can find. Uh, I need a chief financial officer. If you, if you think about the areas where we're hurting, academic side, we got great people that are working. I don't mean we don't have people, but they're all contract people, and they won't be here with us forever. We've got to have people who are committed and will live the system. And so that's an area I'm going to be concentrating on, too. HR, finance, and where else? Uh, the academic side. Okay. Uh, superintendent of schools. Will you be asking um, corporations for any sort of assistance, um, whether it be monetary or support-wise uh, in other ways? When, uh, like your former employer, General Motors. <laughs> <laughs> when, the, when the governor uh, announced me and I talked to some of you afterwards, and I went to the phone, and I called some foundations, and I called some corporations, and guess what? They are all interested in impacting this system because they know it's in their best interest. They're the recipients of what we produce. So what I said to them, I want you to hold on for a minute. I want us to get the plan, put the plan in front of you, and we want to see where you fit into that plan. So they're not shying off, and the foundations are not shying off. And as a matter of fact, some of them that we all know by name have said conclusively to the governor, we're not coming until you get a leader that we can believe in. We're not throwing money into a black hole. I'm going to make sure it's not a black hole. We're going to make sure it's aimed at educating the young people in our community. So here I am. I'm all you've got. And, uh, at this point, I'm the best you've got. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm committed. What you Robert, thank you all very much. Robert, last question. To know. This is the last besides, one for my buddy. <laughs> besides the family enrollment, besides budget deficit, besides school closing, do you see where there has been this continual nagging of politics, hidden agenda, those who have other motives, how do you intend to deal with that problem? Because that seems to be the root cause of all the problems we have in CPS. Well, it's, it's a problem that uh, exists across this nation where you have elected school boards. People trying to apply pressure to them to get the things they want. And sometimes it can drive a school board into paralysis. I don't suggest that's what happened here. But the governor knew about that problem. The state legislature knew about that problem. And Public Act 4 that appointed me to this position says, we're going to fix it so you don't have to deal with that. As I said, I want to deal with school board members that want to participate. And president of the union, if they want to participate. And if we all aim toward the same goal, but if they don't, buddy, I'm gone. This train just left the station. But I don't think I have to walk in the door with a hatchet doing that to people. I want people to participate if they can. And this stuff out here, I'm not going to even deal with it. What do you think is the biggest You waste problem? my time and my energy and you hurt kids when you do that. I'm not going to deal with it. Thank you very much.